So probably I can, uh, good morning everyone, can you hear me? Okay, so I don't hear anything, but I would assume you guys can hear me. If not, please text me. I want to make sure you guys can hear me. So uh, today, uh, first I want to thank Tamiya for the kind of invitation. I'm really fortunate. Actually, Tamiya was hired me at Merck at West Point. So I work at Merck at four years, West Point, uh, in the preclinical DMPK. And then I got the opportunity to work at Pfizer for five years at La Jolla and then 12 years at Genentech uh, in South San, South San Francisco. So firstly, I began my journey at Genentech as senior principal scientist, and then I currently grew, gradually grew myself, uh, and I become, a, a, you know, executive director and the head of clinical pharmacology to oversee the GRAD uh, oncology portfolios. So here is the outline of my presentation. So first, I want to give you a background on the drug development and also the role of clean farm in drug development. I believe Tommy already gave you some the uh, some context of clinical pharmacology. I will go qu uh, very quickly, and then I will focus on the first in human study, uh, the design consideration, and also with some specific focus on the first in human studies for the novel modalities such as the gene and the cell therapies. And the Jesse will take over to talk uh, to walk you through the clean farm study design considerations and how we and also additional analysis to show how we assess the intrinsic and the intrinsic factors that Tommy already mentioned to affect the uh, PK and the safety and efficacy. And the lastly is the summary. So here again is the overview of drug discovery and development. So I think, I guess you guys already see this type of, uh, type of schema uh, very often. So basically drug di discovery development including three uh, portions. So first is the preclinical uh, discovery research and development. So including target identification, lead optimization identification. And then once we identify the lead, we will further characterize the anatomy and the safety uh, profiles for this uh, lead candidate in the preclinical development. So to enable the IND filing so that we can get into the clinical development stage. So in the clinical development stage, we have three phases, phase one, phase two, and phase three. And here you can see the goal for the different phases are different. So this is our basic the clinical development, try to understand first the safety. So the phase one is mainly on safety. And the second, uh, the phase two is mainly on the preliminary efficacy to achieve, to really evaluate whether the molecule works or not. And then the uh, the phase three is usually the pivotal restrictional trial to really evaluate efficacy versus safety. And the once the molecule was approved uh, by the NDA and the uh, BLA filings, so we also have additional phase three study to further assess the safety and efficacy in the market. So again, the drug discovery development is a recirculate, uh, it's a kind of continuous learning and a confirming process. So just want to further elaborate on the clinical trial phases because given uh, you know today's uh, talk is mainly on the phase one. So I just want to quickly touch upon for the phase one, uh, in general, the patient population is a healthy volunteer studies, uh, but again, depends on the indication and also the molecule characteristics. We sometimes also study first in human study in patient. So usually the uh, study side is a phase one clinical units, and the, for patient pop for patient, they usually uh, you know occur in the hospitals. And for the phase one study, usually there are two different scheduling. One is the single ascending dose, we call SAD, and also short multiple ascending dose, we call MAD. So usually phase one study is relatively short, it's days or weeks. And the key objective for the phase one, I think today I will probably will repeat several times, is understanding the safety and the tolerability is the key objectives. Of course, the secondary objective, we can also try to understand the pharmacokinetics and the pharmacodynamics of the molecules. At phase two, 
is mainly uh, to understand the preliminary efficacy. So given th with that goal, is made, uh, the patient population is inpatient. The study, uh, study site is usually a clinical unit and mostly will be hospital. And in this case, will be multiple dose levels with those ranging was recommended. And the phase two study usually lasts weeks or months, depends on the indications and also the disease. So the primary objectives for the phase two is to understand the proof of mechanism, POM, or proof of concept. So proof of mechanism is really understand the biological effect of your molecule to your uh, to uh, to your body. And the POC, the proof of concept, is usually to see whether the molecule can achieve our clinical efficacy we would like to achieve. And in the phase two, we usually do those rangings, uh, two to three dose levels, and to really understand F safety and also preclinical efficacy. Additionally, with a little bit large number of patients, we will also further characterize PKPD relationships. And for the phase three, it's a large phase three studies, uh, usually uh, ranging a couple hundred patients, even to a thousand patients, depends on the disease. Again, the patient population is a patient, and most of the time is in the hospitals. And usually in this time, we evaluate one or two dose levels uh, with repeated dosing. And the goal here is efficacy. So we want to demonstrate the efficacy and the long-term safety comparison with of the standard of care. And also given large amount of patient, we can also conduct robust PKPD modeling to support those selections and also the filing. So lastly, is the phase four, once we get approval, and again, we want to do phase three, uh, phase four study in patient population at approved dose levels, and usually the duration of the trials last months and years to really assess the long-term safety efficacy and in the real world settings. And also the other things, uh, if you don't do the dose finding uh, in the clinical trials, we may also uh, can evaluate additional alternative dosing schedule and the combination. So what are the signs of clinical pharmacology? I think uh, Tamiya already for elaborated really well uh, what is clinical pharmacology. Actually, it has two components. One is on the experimental part. So actually, as I mentioned earlier, the different phase one, phase two, and phase three, the dose finding, POC, POA, uh, phase two study, or confirmative trial phase three study, all part of the experimental pharmacology. Additionally, Jesse will uh, some uh, Tamiya also mentioned additional clean farm focus study, and then later on Jesse will further elaborate. For example, how we uh, we conduct drug drug interaction study, food effects study, and the relative BA study, etc. And uh, the other big component for the is for clinical pharmacology uh, for the modern days, uh, how we can leverage modeling and simulation. So basically, we use uh, quantitative tools try to integrate PK PD efficacy and safety to understand the variability and certainty and also intrinsic and extrinsic factors with the purpose to understanding, to, to really finding the appropriate dose for every patient. And I think the goal here, we try to understand the dose response curve for both efficacy and safety. So we are hoping we can find the right dose for every patient population uh, by understanding the PK pharmacology and also the variability and certainty in the patient. So I think Tamiya also briefly touched upon and here, uh, you know, how the clean farm can contribute to the drug development. So here I just showing one of the uh, uh, packet insert, which is using a Latin name, which is one of the elk oncology uh, molecules. You can see the one I highlight light blue. I think that's a mean for you to really see the uh, small font, but the goal here is to say, you know, more than 50% of the package insert are actually provided by the clean farm studies and analysis. So which is including the how we best use the molecule, how we dose the molecule, et cetera. So here are some of the clinical pharmacology contribution uh, to the potentially during the different stage of the drug development. So at the preclinical IND, so I think the key objective for the clinical pharmacology is to understanding the translational PKPD to project uh, you know, first in human starting dose and also uh, efficacious uh, countries, uh, target efficacious dose. 
And in the phase one, I think it's may as much I will further elaborate. In this case, we mainly do the dose escalation. And again, the key goal is safety. So here we main goal is we want to identify maximum tolerate dose uh, if possible, and also to characterize the PK and the PD relationships. And additionally, we will also want to use the PK-PD relationship to design the phase two study, such as, uh, you know, simulate different dosing schedule, uh, identify two to three dose to be tested in the phase two. And in the phase two, again, will be the dose ranging study, two to three doses. And the primary objective is to uh, understanding what's the preliminary efficacy we would like to, we, we are going to achieve with these molecules. And to further confirm also the, uh, some of the clinical safety, the goal here, we try to understanding dose concentration and the response relationships. And uh, to, so that we can collect meaningful data so we can do clinical trial study and to support Go no go decisions, and if there's a goal, what will be the optimal phase three study designs? And the lastly, phase three, as I mentioned earlier, is more like confirmation of the dose and also the safety and efficacy profiles. So it's the overall benefit risk profiles compared to the standard of care. Are we provide much more benefit over the risk? And the further refined dose concentration response relationship. And in this case, we usually, given there's a large patient population, we usually collect sparse uh, PK and PD samples to further support, uh, support the labeling claims. So after the approval, I think there's also, it doesn't mean we stop here. We, we will explore newer indication and combination. And we also support manufacturer change and the formulation and the device bridging, even some different dosing, alternative dosing schedules. So today's presentation, I will mainly focus on the phase one study design. So uh, first in human studies, and uh, I will try to uh, cover the general consideration, and then I will specifically go into uh, small molecule biologics and also novel modality. In this case, uh, mainly focus on uh, gene and cell therapies. So here are the key objectives uh, in the early clinical development. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the first in human study is safety. So if we will evaluate the safety and the tolerability. And also, if possible, we also want to uh, understanding the PK characteristics of the molecule when we're increasing uh, the single and the repeated dose of the study drugs. Additionally, we also want to understand the relationship between dose, exposure, and also effect to help us guide dosing and schedulings. And the, the third uh, objective, we want to understand the source of availabilities because even we dose the same medicine to different patients, so different subjects, they have different concentrations, they're not exactly the same, they also have different response. So we want to understand what are the intrinsic and extrinsic factor to really impact the PK, pharmacokinetics, and also the PD, the biomarker, and also efficacy and safety. So with the goal that we can a guided dose adjustment for different uh, you know, subgroups to maximize efficacy while mit mit risk mitigate safeties. And uh, lastly, you know, given this is a clinical experiment, we don't even the, know the drug candidate actually eventually will become a drug. So we will continue to assess whether this drug candidate actually has the potential to become a drug. So there will be a lot of decision making whether we want to continue to do phase two or phase three, the go no go decisions based on the evolving clinical data. So here are the phase one overview of the SAD, uh, which we call single ascending dose, and the MAD is multiple ascending dose. The general, very generic overall study design. So in general, we have maybe six to nine, uh, you know, around five to six SAD cohorts at the different dose levels. So usually uh, is, uh, the dose level is between around three, two to three fold uh, difference between the different dose. And, and also we usually conduct a SAD first. And then uh, once we collect enough uh, safety from the SAD, maybe during the SAD escalation, we can start to trigger parallel the MAD uh, dose escalation. So usually the dose levels for the MAD cohort, uh, usually uh, the dose is lower than the one we are being tested uh, in the SAD as being so safe. So I think in general, again, as I mentioned earlier, the first in human 
studied. The primary objective is safety and tolerability. And the second objective is PKPD to assess the change after single and the multiple doses. And the exploratory objective is also try to understanding the PKPD and the safety relationship. So here I just want to uh, first uh, uh, touch a little bit based on the single ascending dose called SAD. So in general, usually small cohort, and we have three to eight patients uh, per dose levels uh, with the treatment. And uh, sometimes we also including placebo uh, subjects uh, in this situation. And uh, if we don't observe any toxicities uh, in this uh, patient, so that means we can continue escalate up. So we can go to a higher dose cohorts uh, per protocol, and then they can give a higher dose. But however, if we observe toxicities or adverse event, so there's a team will uh, talk to investigators. So usually they will be sponsor and investigator discussions. So see whether we want to recruit more patients at the same dose level to further confirm the safety observations, or we reduce the uh, the fold of increase of the dose escalation trajectories. Uh, so maybe instead of go to threefold dose increase, we this time if we see some CT signal, we can do 1.5, or uh, you know maybe even twofold uh, dose increase. Or if there's a very severity, the safety assess uh, safety observed in large a relative a uh, higher proportion of the patient. So we can also make the decision to stop the further dose escalation, even to stop the entire trials. For the MAD is a multiple ascending dose. So again, similar as said, is a, a really small subject cohort per dose levels, uh, around ranging from three to eight. And the dose usually given at a specific regimen, um, you know, depends on the PK characteristics for small molecule, usually the QD and the BID, and the for larger molecule is Qweek and the once monthly, et cetera. And the, the duration of the MAD portion of the phase one is usually defined by the preclinical GLP tox evaluations. So if we, in the clinical trial, in the MAD section, we need, we want to do two week MAD studies. So in this case, we need to conduct two week, uh, preclinical GLP tox in rodent and non rodent. However, if you, we want to do MAD study between the duration between two weeks up to six months, Again, we want to match the clinical planned duration in the uh, non uh, in the non clinical GLP talks uh, that match of the clinical planned MAD durations, and if we want to test the MAD duration, I think usually it's rarely for the MAD in healthy volunteers. Usually that would be happy in patient greater than six months, which is means we need to conduct her, conduct a, a repeat talk studies in non clinical species in rodent for six months and then in nine uh, nine months, uh, and six months uh, for European requirement. Again, the dose escalation desiccation will follow the similar consideration for the sad portion. Uh, we will based on the safety, tolerability, and the PK. So if you start to see some adverse event and a safety, uh, safety event, so you may consider, you can, you can make some decision. Do we want to stay in the same dose with more patient, or we want to reduce the dose escalation trajectory, or we want to stop the dose escalation? And in general, the SAD and MAD usually conduct in the same study. And we call, uh, you know, when we mix a healthy volunteer and a patient in the same study, we call umbrella study. And, and then usually sometimes we, in the umbrella, umbrella study, we also including some of the clean farm uh, specific questions, for example, whether this molecule have food effect, usually that's applicable for small molecule. What's the relative availability if we change the manufacture of formulation? So we can incorporate those information. For example, if you switch from tablet, of uh, caps from tablet, so we can do some additive bioavailability studies. Again, the more component, more complex of the study you incorporate in these studies protocols, and there will be more risk for delaying the health authority approval. But again, if we get approval, we will gain significant amount of time to really address using one study to address multiple questions. 
So in general, when we use umbrella study, we usually need to meet certain criteria. So we usually need the molecule have excellent toxic coverage and also wide therapeutic window. So very convincing safety margins. And the toxicity we have been seeing clinical in the animals usually reversible, monitorable, and non-vital. Otherwise, I don't think we can readily use these umbrella protocols. And also, we need to understand whether we have suitable PD marker to support those selections. And again, the pharmacol, there's no mechanism-based toxicities that are related for these molecules.